scripture reading for this morning is chapter 18 of 1 Samuel. And so if you will turn to that chapter and follow along, we'll read through the account of David's life that is presented here. <coughs> now it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. And Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, including his sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and prospered. And Saul set him over the men of war. And it was pleasing in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And it happened as they were coming when David returned from killing the Philistine that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with the tambourines with joy and with musical instruments. And the women sang as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Then Saul became very angry, for the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, but to me they have ascribed thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul looked at David with suspicion from that day on. Now it came about on the next day that an evil spirit from God came mightily upon Saul, and he raved in the midst of the house while David was playing the harp with his hand, as usual. And a spear was in, Paul's, in Saul's hand. And Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped from his presence twice. Now Saul was afraid of David, for the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from his presence and appointed him as his commander of a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David was prospering in all his ways, for the Lord was with him. When Saul saw that he was prospering greatly, he dreaded him. Some of you may have the authorized version. I, I did not look this up specifically again, but I believe it reads something like feared. But it is a word that means something more like dread and awe. But all Israel and Judah loved David, and he went out and came in before them. Then Saul said to David, Here is my older daughter Merab. I will give her to you as a wife, only be a valiant man for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, My hand shall not be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. But David said to Saul, Who am I, and what is my life or my father's family in Israel, that I should be the king's son-in-law? So it came about at the time when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given to Israel, the Moholathite, for a wife. Now Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David. When they told Saul the thing was agreeable to him, and Saul thought, I will give her to him, that she may, may become a snare to him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore Saul said to David for a second time, You may be my son-in-law today. Then Saul commanded his servants, Speak to David secretly, saying, Behold, the king delights in you, and all his servants love you. Now therefore become the kin, king's son-in-law. So Saul's servants spoke these words to David, but David said, Is it trivial in your sight to become the king's son-in-law since... I am a poor man and lightly esteemed. And the servants of Saul reported to him according to these words which David spoke. Saul then said, Thus you shall say to David, 
The king does not desire any dire except a hundred force against of the Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. Now Saul planned to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. When his servants told David these words, it pleased David to become the king's son-in-law. Before the days had expired, David rose up and went, he and his men, and struck down two hundred men among the Philistines. Then David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full number to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. So, David, so Saul gave him Michael, his daughter, for a wife. When Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him, then Saul was even more afraid of David. Thus Saul was David's enemy continually. Then the commanders of the Philistines went out to battle, and it happened as often as they went out that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul. So his name was highly esteemed. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word, and let's bow together in a moment of prayer. Father, we thank Thee for the Word of God and for the preservation of it that we so many centuries later might read the accounts that describe the ways in which Thou hast worked and labored in the hearts of chosen men so many centuries ago. We thank Thee for the selection of David as the King of Israel in sovereign grace, and we thank Thee for the way in which his life reminds us in so many ways of David's greatest son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We thank Thee, Lord, for the ministry that that great man had and the greater ministry that his great son and greater son should have later on. We thank Thee that we live in the days of the greatness of the Son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank Thee for His atoning work, and we thank Thee for the way in which He has become victorious over Satan, and has made it possible for us to enter into the possession of the blessings of eternal life, and into the confidence that Thou art with us through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray that the lessons of the account that we just read may come home to us. Father, we are grateful for the whole church of Jesus Christ, and would bring them all before Thee today, and pray that the entire body scattered over the face of this globe may experience the blessing of our great God in heaven. We pray particularly for Believer's Chapel and its ministries and for its needs. We especially remember those who've requested our prayers, for those who are sick and some who are suffering very deeply. We commit them to Thee. We ask, O God, that Thou wilt minister to them, deliver them from their sufferings in accordance with Thy will. And above all, Lord, give them the sense of Thy presence with them through the Lord Jesus. We pray that Thou bless in the Sunday school, the hour that follows. May our Lord be lifted up. May our teachers teach in the power of the Holy Spirit with concern and with the skills that Thou hast given to them to bring the Word of God home to the hearts of those who hear. We commit those important meetings to Thee. We ask, Lord, Thy blessing upon us in this meeting as well. And Father, we would not forget our country in these very difficult days. We pray for our President, for the others who are involved so closely with him in the affairs of the United States. We bring this country to Thee, give wisdom and guidance to our leaders, direct their steps, protect our citizens from harm, deliver them from the enemies that would destroy them. We commit this country to Thee, pray particularly for Thy sovereign providence 
in these difficult days. Be with us now, Lord, in our meeting as we sing, as we listen to the Word of God, for Jesus' sake. Amen. The subject for today in the continuation of our studies in the life of David is providence and the ways of love and envy. The conflict with Goliath has passed, but David's trials and struggles have only begun. Reminiscent of the words that the apostles spoke in Lystra when uh, he was expressing the ways in which we do enter into the kingdom of God, and it was pointed out there that through many tribulations we must enter into the kingdom of God. I think that the experience of the apostles and others is the experience of every one of us. The things that God has set before us are the things that are designed for our good, and frequently tribulation is the experience of our human lives. Divine providence guides David, the young anointed king to be, and the path of God for David, as is very plain from this chapter and will be plain throughout all of his life, includes the sweet and the bitter, both Saul and Saul's son. On the one hand, there is the covenantal love of Jonathan. Notice the way in which it is described. In verse 1, Jonathan loved him as himself. And that is repeated in verse 3. Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. It's no wonder when Jonathan finally met his death, the description of his death by David is one of the nicest things in the books of Samuel. Samuel. It, he describes Saul and Jonathan in this way. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and pleasant in their life and in their death, they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. How have the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? Jonathan is slain on your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was more wonderful than the love of women. How have the mighty fallen and the weapon of war perished? The covenantal love of Jonathan. But on the other hand, there is the murderous envy of Saul. Both are in God's purpose and plan for maturity. And the thing that is the occasion of the manifestation of Saul's hatred of David and uh, pinning it down to something specific, it is that that brought out his envy. I guess there is no sin among Christians that is more significant than envy. This past week I was reading in the paper and uh, turned to Dear Abby and read in Dear Abby something that pertained to what we're talking about today. A lady wrote in and said, my husband and I do not get along very well. In fact, if it weren't for the kids, I wouldn't live within a thousand miles of this idiot. We are both artists, and my husband specializes in Western art. And he's been selling his paintings before the oil is dry on his canvas. I don't mean to put him down, but my work is much better than his, even if it doesn't sell half as well. The public just happens to be going for gimmick art. I can hardly stand it when my, cus my husband sells a painting. For one thing, he has a way of gloating that makes me want to put my fist right through his face. I wish I know knew how to get over this envious attitude. Can you help me? And so Abby helps him. Of all the emotions, envy is the most difficult to control. Since you don't even like your husband and you're competing with him professionally to boot, it will be doubly different, difficult to curb your envy. Keep telling yourself that envy is an acid. <laughs> 
that does more damage to the container, you, than the object of your en envy. Well, that's good common sense advice, I guess. You don't find it in scripture, of course. We do not, we're never so far as I know told that envy is an acid, but it is true that envy does more damage to ourselves usually than it does to the other person of whom we're envious. And one finds an illustration of it in this very chapter. Well, we've said that this kind of conflict, that is, the conflict of the Christian life affects us all. One of the reasons for this, and it's evident in the life of David particularly, is that God has great things in store for David, and the things that he must pass through as experiences are things that are fitting him for his ultimate rule. Those who hope to rule must first learn to obey, Matthew Henry said a long time ago. That is true. Well, let's look for a few moments this morning at the chapter, the 18th chapter, and first we'll take a rather brief look at John, the covenantal love of Jonathan and David because later on I want to expand upon it a little bit. Jonathan's name, as you probably know, means essentially Yahweh has given. Nathan in Hebrew is the word that means to give. And Jonathan is derived from the word for God. So Jonathan's name, a beautiful name, lovely name to give your children, the Lord has given, or the gift of God. Jonathan, we must not think, was a weak person. Jonathan was anything but that. He was every inch a man. Earlier chapters in this book explain that he was a warrior. He was very brave. I could talk, we could turn to specific passages. It would take us too long to support this, but I assure you it's true. He was very respected by the people and by the soldiers, a loving man and a spiritual man. In fact, at one point it is stated that Jonathan encouraged David in the Lord. He was an individual who was a principled individual and a self-sacrificing one if one ever was a self-sacrificing one. The one person who had reason to be jealous of David was Jonathan. He was the prince. He was the one who was to ascend to the throne as Saul's son. But he gives it all up for the one with whom he has fallen in love, David. How the mighty have fallen, David said when Jonathan died, and it was true, Jonathan was a mighty man. If we look at Jonathan and just consider him briefly, no doubt when Goliath came out and terrified the children of Israel, according to Scripture, all of them were terrified. And we may gather that Jonathan also felt some of the fear that would be natural when a man like Goliath came out and spoke to the children of Israel as he did. In fact, in the 24th verse of the 17th chapter, we read, when all the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him and were greatly afraid. So, it's no doubt true that Jonathan felt fear. So, he was first terrified. But then came to be satisfied with David. His soul was knit to the soul of David. It was almost love at first sight among men in the truest and purest sense. And we can gather that because there was such harmony between the two, there was a great agreement between the two in the things that they believed in. In fact, we are told in the Old Testament very specifically that uh, two cannot walk together except they be agreed. And so we gather from this, this friendship from, of David and, and uh, Jonathan is a union of souls. In fact, a union of souls in which there is more or less accord. And so we can put Jonathan and David together as men who stand for the things of the Lord captivated by David finally, 
We read in the very next chapter in the second verse, or the first verse, and the second sentence of it, but Jonathan, Saul's son, greatly delighted in David. So, fearful, but then he came to know David and came to be attached to him, and finally he was captivated by David. In fact, one of the greatest statements, I think, of the Word of God is found in verse 4, and Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him. In other words, Jonathan in effect says, I want to give you my right to the throne, and he gave him the things that had to do with his standing as the prince in Israel. Gave it to David with his armor, his sword, his bow, and his belt. A magnificent expression of love for David and also a magnificent expression of self-abnegation. It reminds us of two things. It reminds us, of course, of Paul, of, of Paul the greater Saul, and his statement regarding his coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, and how finally after he had given up everything that he had, he gave up the loss of everything, he says, as he wrote to the Philippians. But above all, it reminds us of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we'd like to expand upon that later on, but not today. We read in verse 2 that Saul took him. That is, took him in the sense that he did not let him return to his father's house, taken hostage for future work by divine providence. I have no doubt that this was by divine providence. Saul took him, but God was behind Saul, and it was done in order that David might begin to prepare for, for ultimately what God had for him. I would imagine that David had no understanding of what was transpiring. It was a great privilege now to be li living in the royal court, and no doubt he had no understanding fully. He knew that he had been anointed to be the king ultimately, so Samuel had said, but there is little indication that he understood the fullness of what was involved, but God was preparing him for what was to come. A few weeks ago I mentioned the statement by Luther who said concerning a theologian, a theologian is made by prayer, by meditation, and by trial. And now David really begins school in earnest. Aren't you happy? Tomorrow's the day, isn't it? School begins. Well, David begins school as well. And he begins the school of the Lord God in order to per prepare him for what is to come. So Saul took him, did not let him return to his father's house. And David went out wherever Saul sent him and prospered. And Saul set him over the men of war, and it was pleasing in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. But now the flames of envy begin to burn in the heart of Saul. Everyone is pleased at this point, but there is one discordant note. Acid is working in the soul of King Saul. Saul's envy. And isn't it striking the way in which in this instant two things result from the actions of David and Saul? One, the love of David, the love of David by Jonathan, and the other, the envy of David by Saul. The occasion of the flames of envy in this chapter is described in verses 6 and 7. And it happened as they were coming when David returned from killing the Philistine that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Now, of course, the obvious thing that meets us immediately is, well, it is a downgrading of Saul and an upgrading of David. 
Saul has slain his thousands. David has slain his ten thousands. And that's the way that Saul was affected by this too. But reflect for a moment. Who did the slaying? Was it really David? Well, if you look at it from the standpoint of the Word of God, David himself said he came against Goliath in the name of the Lord God. And in fact, the account has been telling us over and over again that the reason that David is prosperous is because God was with him. It's not God who slew, it's not David who slew Goliath, it ultimately is God who slew Goliath. It's God who was behind the man and gave him this miraculous victory with a slingshot over the mighty warrior of the Philistines. So the women have made a fundamental mistake. And the fundamental mistake that they've made is to sing and dance with the musical instruments and joy and praise Saul for slaying ten thousands and praise David for his, did I say thousands? David his ten thousands when they should have been praising God for the victory. You know, sometimes I think in evangelicalism we forget the simplest things, just as those women forgot the simplest things. And so we hear someone give a message, give a testimony, sing a beautiful song, and what do audiences do today? They clap. Clap for the individual, when really standing behind anything that is worthwhile in spiritual things is the Lord God. I think it is much more suitable for us to be quiet in our spirits and express our thanksgiving to God, for He stands behind anything that is worthwhile in the work of the Lord, and let us never forget that. Saul has slain his thousands. David has slain his ten thousands. No, no. Those were instruments in the hand of the Lord God. Salvation, victory, the slaughter of the enemies of God is always by the hands of the Lord God. Now, the occasion, though, is this. And the words of the women singing have stirred up the envy that is in the heart of King Saul. Jealousy, Scripture says, is the rage of a man. And one can see it here. On the one hand, we have the picture of David playing on his harp before King Saul, and King Saul playing with his javelin in his hand. Isn't it an interesting picture? David playing on the harp, and Saul playing with his javelin. And the response is the response of the flames of envy. Someone has said, the bright day brings out the adder. And it's a bright day of victory in Israel. And now there comes out the adder. And the adder is envy in the heart of King Saul. But actually, envy is not the real problem. If you'll go back and look at the history of Saul from the beginning, you'll find that the significant thing about Saul is that he begins without a knowledge of God. I don't know whether you've ever noticed this or not, but the one person, so far as we know, who did not know anything about Samuel the prophet was Saul's father and Saul himself. You study First and Second Samuel through, and Kish, you remember, was Saul's father. Samuel was known up and down the land as the great prophet. He was an old man now. Everybody knew him. But Kish evidently didn't know him. And Saul didn't know him. And if you'll know that, remember the story, Saul was out on the hills looking for Kish's asses. In other words, he is a, a cattleman and a rancher. And Saul and Kish are interested in one thing, not spiritual things. They're interested in their making of their living. And it's brought home so plainly when finally the servant of Saul, 
when Saul cannot find the asses, and he's been out on the hills looking for them, the servant says, there's a man of God. Isn't it interesting? The servant knows the man of God. Kish doesn't know him. Saul doesn't know him. But the servant knows him. If you have any servants, it's very good to have a servant who knows the Lord. There are instances in the Bible, you know, where this is true, where the insignificant people are the ones that God has brought to the knowledge of himself, and they're the ones through whom God works. Well, the servant finally spoke to Saul, and he says, you know, there's a man of God, a seer, and you might get some information from him. And so they went to the place where Samuel was, and when uh, finally Saul confronts Samuel and uh, sees him, we read, Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and says, Please tell me where the seer's house is. And Samuel answered Saul and, Saul and said, I am the seer. He saw him face to face and did not even know him. The one person in Israel who stood out as the spiritual man known by all the people and revered by all the people as the great prophet of God. And Saul doesn't know him. You see, the real problem with Saul begins fundamentally in the fact that he does not have a relationship with the Lord God. I know you're going to think about the fact that he prophesied, but it's possible for people to engage in the outward kinds of things that characterize prophecy and not have an inward relationship to the Lord God. That's another question. Maybe we'll deal with it later on. But fundamentally, Saul's difficulty was alienation from God in his heart. In other words, let me put it this way. Alienation from God is congenial soil for the rooting of envy. In other words, Abby, it's very good to tell us that envy is like acid, but from what does envy come? It comes from disobedience to the Lord God ultimately. I would imagine that you can look back in your life and you can think of specific instances in which you too have fallen into envy of your fellow Christians or of your fellow non-Christians, as the case may be. Envy. It begins right there. The congenial soil is alienation from God. It blinds us to the actual facts. It leads to the imputation of false motives to those for whom we have envy. It makes us wretched. It impels to deeds that are not harmonious with the will of God and are contrary to the Word of God. And as a matter of fact, it may lead even, as we read here, to murder. It impels to bloody deeds, and the illustrations of the new, throughout the Old and New Testament are very plain. Pilate looked at Israel and he said, For envy you have delivered the Lord God. That was the reason. And even the man of the world, Pilate, the procurator, could see that. And the progress of Saul's envy is interesting. In verse 9 we read, Saul looked at David with suspicion. And then in verse 12 we read, now Saul was afraid of David. And then in verse 15, we read, when Saul saw that he was prospering greatly, he dreaded him. And uh, finally, we go on to read in verse 29, and Saul was even more afraid of David. Thus, Saul was David's enemy continually. Jealousy to awe and wait, that's not the end of it. In chapter 19, in verse 1, now Saul told Jonathan his son and all his servants to put David to death. But Jonathan, Saul's son, greatly delighted in David. So we have alienation from God, jealousy, awe, and ultimately the desire to murder. If you go back and look at the parallel between our Lord and David, it's remarkable. It's almost as if David is the appearance. Now, I'm going to qualify this. 
is the appearance in measure of the Lord Jesus before his time. The experiences of David are the experiences of the antitype, remembering, of course, that David is a sinner, but nevertheless, a person upon whom God has put his hand to perform his will. And the experiences of our Lord were that he was loved and that he was hated. And David, we've seen and will see, was loved and he was hated. Now, this leads to the plot of Saul's jealous rage. And we, in the rest of the chapter from verse 17 through verse 30, read of those plots. Knowing why things were going wrong for him evidently, or at least deep down in his heart, and knowing why they were going right for David, that is, his loss of covenantal favor. He's been told by Samuel he's been rejected. Knowing these things, there follows a war of plots. Just like John the Baptist and Herod, and just like the experience is of life. And so the one thing that he must do is, if it is possible, to destroy David in order to preserve his own position. The first plot is one regarding his daughter Mirab. Let David win his spurs and fight the Lord's battles. Isn't that interesting? Notice verse 17, then Saul said to David, here is my older daughter Mirab. I will give her to you as a wife, wife, only be a valiant man for me and fight the Lord's battles. Now, I want to translate that. Fight the Lord's battles for me. In other words, David is put in the thick of things in order to fight the Lord's battles. Those are Saul's words, but they really were fighting Saul's battles. For they were the battles that Saul should be fighting. But David is to win his spurs. That's Saul's point. Win your spurs, David, and show us that you really have it. And fight the Lord's battles. But they're really the Lord's battles that Saul should be fighting. Well, it came about at the time when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David that she was given to Adriel, the Maholathite, for a wife. They had five children. They were slain. I don't know the connection between them, but it's obvious that God's hand was not upon the union. Then the remainder of the chapter is devoted to the relationship between Saul, Michael, and David. And so in the spirit of Psalm 55, 21, you know what that reads like? Psalm 55 and verse 21 reads this way. David speaking. This is one of his psalms. And we read his speech. He's talking about his enemies. He's put forth his hands against those who were at peace with him. He's violated his covenant. His speech was smoother than butter, but his heart was war. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. It's almost as if David were thinking of Saul. His speech smoother than butter. So, David, Michael loves you. When they told Saul about this fact, it was agreeable to him, and Saul said, I will give her to him that she may become a snare to him. Envy, the acid is working. It's all ultimately from alienation from the Lord God, but it's working. And Give my daughter to David, he thinks, that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. So Saul makes the arrangement. For a second time, David, you may be my son-in-law today. Well, in this case, of course, it came to pass, and David did become the son-in-law of Saul, and God's hand behind all of the wickedness of the king in putting David right in the court, and now not only in the court, as his psychologist playing his harp to help him through his difficult times, but now actually a member of the royal family. All of this, of course, it seems to me, 
obviously done so that when the time came for Saul to depart, it would not be such a change to realize that God had laid his hand upon David and that he already related to royalty might move into the office of king that much more easily. Now, let me sum up what I want to say to you. Envy, like jealousy, is, as the Scriptures say, cruel as the grave. Its flashes are the flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. When one looks at what Scripture has to say and reflects upon the many instances of this, right here in this account, we have Elab, the brother of David, who speaks disparagingly of his own young brother. We remember Joseph's brethren who were envious of Joseph. We remember Cain, envious of Abel. We remember the crucifixion of our Lord. The one purpose of the Lord God through the Lord Jesus Christ is to make it possible for men to gain the victory over the expressions of sin, and among them, envy is one of the greatest. Envy completed, in a sense, the moral ruin of Saul. There is a statement that I saw in the Word of God that I think uh, brought it out very specifically. Envy does do just that. It completes the moral ruin of Saul. As the worm seeks out the best fruit to eat the heart out of it, so envy fastens on the best and noblest persons to hate and hurt them. It goes by quick steps to injury, even to murder. Saul spake to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. O oh, cursed envy! O oh, hideous ingratitude! O oh, foul and furious jealousy! On the other hand, God's hand is working, and the leading theme, the light motif, as the Germans like to say, the light motif of David's life is God's presence with him. We see it in this chapter in verse 12, Saul was afraid of David, for the Lord was with him. And then again, in verse 14, we read, And David was prospering in all his ways, for the Lord was with him. God's providential purpose, all conquering in the heart and life of his servant David. And let me say to you, my Christian friend, it is so with every one of us. Let us not forget, we're not King David's, but we belong to the Lord just as surely as David belonged to the Lord. The Scriptures make it very plain that a sovereign providence guides all of our steps. And if we have believed in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it is true of us, as Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, that we may know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose, there may be many tribulations, but through them we shall surely enter into the kingdom of God. For whom He foreknew, He predestinated to become conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. And whom He predestined, He also called. And whom He called, these He also justified. And whom He justified, these He also glorified. And so those foreknown, in the ages of eternity past are ultimately to be conformed to the image of the Son. And the process by which that takes place is the sovereign purpose of an infinite God. Haman may fight the Jews, but is sure to be defeated. The Scottish kings, both male and female, may fight John Knox, but God's purposes for Scotland come to pass. Not only Mary, Queen of Scots, but the English kings and the French kings and the prelates and the popes, minions, and all of them arrayed against the one man, John Knox, who feared neither man nor woman, and God's hand was upon him, 
And today in the land of Scotland, the land of the Reformation, there's still some vestiges left, not too many, but some vestiges left of the work of God through the one man, John Knox, in the 16th century. Saul's wrathful plots only serve what God intends to do for David. Do you remember the scripture? God makes the wrath of men to praise him. And let me assure you that that is true for every one of us as well. If we engage in things that are contrary to his will, his purpose is going to be accomplished. And if there are individuals who fight and struggle against the purposes of God, seek in every way as Saul did to, in a sense, to deny the election of David that had taken place, God makes the wrath of men to praise him. How marvelous it is to know that a sovereign providence guides all of our steps. Surprisingly, we're stopping this morning on time. Look at the back. Isn't that a beautiful thing? <laughs> if you're here today and you've never believed in our Lord Jesus Christ, you do not have the confidence and the assurance of the sovereign providence of God guiding your steps, though they may be, it may be doing just that because you may be included within those who are God's intent to bring to our Lord Jesus as belonging to Him. My prayer, my hope for you is that you, if you do not know Him, may come to know Him, whom to know is life eternal, and that you may have the confidence of the sovereign purpose of God guiding your steps to come to Christ. Believe in Him who died for sinners that they might have life. Let's stand for the benediction. Father, we thank Thee for the Word of God and for the many lessons that are contained within it. Deliver us from envy and jealousy, the rage of men. And help us also to remember that fundamentally there can be no deliverance if there is alienation from God. Envy and jealousy, the inevitable consequences of the lack of knowledge and of relationship to the Lord God in heaven. Father, for those who may be in our audience who do not know our Lord, touch their hearts and draw them to thyself through David's greatest son who suffered on Calvary's cross for sinners. May thy blessing be upon us in the classes that follow and throughout the remainder of this day and this week. For Jesus' sake, amen. amen.